Hey, YouTube. Hey, Brian. Hey, Bruce hey. Ely. Hi. Hi. It's great to have you here. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. You ready to kick this show off? Yep. Yeah. All right. Hello and welcome to Python Bytes, where we deliver Python news and headlines directly to your earbuds. This is episode 278, recorded April 6th, 2022. I'm Michael Kennedy. And I'm Brian Aachen. And I'm Vusile Ndobu. Welcome, Vusile. It's really great to have you here. Uh, you know, I'm really excited and I feel honored to be here. So thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, it's, it's going to be great to share some Python news with you. Now, before we jump into yeah. all those things... Tell us a bit about yourself. What do you do? What are you, what are you into? All right. Firstly, I'd like to say I'm still relatively early on in my career. And um, I'm from Zimbabwe. And uh, we have a small but growing Python community here. And uh, for the long time, I, I, I didn't have any community. So podcasts like your Talk Python podcast was the, the only way I got to come in, connect with community members. So it's really great to be here. But on the question of uh, about me, as I'm a software developer, I, I work in the back end. Uh, I work for a company called Ideation.ai. It's a, a health tech startup that's building information systems that help clinicians manage patients and uh, hospital the hospitals better. So I work mostly on APIs and microservices using Python, Django, Postgres mostly. Right on. That sounds like a really fun project. And we know that healthcare needs help and automation and, and modernization. So thanks. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. All right, Brian, shall we kick it off? Yeah, sure. What are you talking about? Getting drunk or what is this? G getting dunk. <laughs> oh, oh sorry. Drunk. I must have missed that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this was uh, just announced a, a few days ago from Darren Burns. Um, he's he's uh, the uh, engineer that's helping... Um, uh, William, um, is it Will? Will, uh, with with the uh, rich and everything uh, textualized. The, the rich empire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, this is just really cool because I, I often want to do the dunk. He, he released dunk. So dunk is a um, a, a prettier get diff uh, tool, and it's uh, it uses rich and it um, it's just a command line tool and it's beautiful. Um, so you just uh, even install it and then you do a get diff on something uh it could be one file or it could be uh it's usually a commit right so you do a diff of whatever you have now or other stuff and it just instead of doing the weird uh like the hard to read the, the command plus line minus diff, plus yeah uh, yeah that thing um it's got these nice uh just this nice colors with rich of like you know what was added what was green for added red for taken out um and the line numbers it's beautiful um and he's it's still a work in progress but i'm using it already it's just great uh this is fantastic when i first looked at this i thought it was like um a gooey window that was showing but no there's just the terminal yeah um yeah yeah it's pretty this cool one of the to see in a text editor right yeah definitely exactly. some text editors have have something that like this nice but just on the command line it's super cool um the one of my first questions with it was sometimes I have a lot of diff stuff. So mm -hmm. does this have a pager? And the answer from uh, Darren was it does not have a pager, but um, but you can use uh, last dash capital R. I don't know what the R does, but anyway, um, if you pipe get diff to dunk and then pipe it to less dash R, you've got a diff with a pager. That works for me. I, I'll just alias that to something. So uh, yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. Anyway, uh, pretty quick, pretty short uh, topic, but um, for people that are looking at uh, Git diffs a lot, this is a super handy thing to look at. Yeah, this is neat. So, I usually do a lot of my diffs in PyCharm, and it actually looks real similar to that UI. Usile, what about you? How do you see your diffs? Yeah, I do most of my coding in Visual Studio Code, and I use the, the Visual Studio diff uh, viewer for that. Same, It's pretty similar to this. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, this looks great, I think. Very nice. It's a good How, job here. Yeah, very nice one. How about we start with some memes? <laughs> so we all heard about Log4j. Uh, and my favorite one was the take on the XKCD about little Bobby tables, the little, little, little Jindy we call <laughs> or something like that. I can't remember. Yeah. But, 
you know, all the jokes aside, like, you know, here's Homer Simpson, zero days without log for JCVE. And uh, oh, maybe gosh. the best one was that, that this guy right here, this, this guy, he looks like he's probably about 75 and retiring says upgraded log, upgrading log for J three times. Wasn't that stressful says Dave, 28 years old, <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, like, is there a log for pie? Like, is this something that we should consider? And my first thought was, yeah, no, we're good. Like we don't have this stupid, like remote method invocation where you can inject like a, a function call as a string inside <laughs> of your, your log message. Oh no. But here's Ari Bovenberg who wrote an article that says, yeah, it's not anywhere near as severe as that, but there are some things you should consider. And so for your consideration, I present this article and some ideas. So it says, look, here's the basics of logging. And this is using Python's built-in logger. I'm, I'm a fan of um, Logbook and Logguru and the sort of higher level nicer things. But nonetheless, here's the basics, right? Yeah. So you can log, like say logger.info or trace or whatever, and then put out a message like, hello world, there's no injection there. You can also do this thing, which is really the crux of the problem across the board, is you can say, here's a formatted string and the data that formats it. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can put in, the problem with log4j was even if the string was fully evaluated as user input or something, um, you take some user input and you fully validate it, it still could have, it'll still get like reinterpreted for these remote like trying to find you know, what machine am I running on or my production or debug? Like, let me go call this function and find out or just call it to hack you. But so you, the Python version doesn't have that, but you can do this like format string and pass this context variable thing, like pass a data structure in. And in that case, some bad stuff can actually happen here. All right. So that's fine. So, well, what about, what if I wrote my, as my name instead of, or my message instead of hello, I wrote hello, quote, backslash n info main user, Alice commented something else. And you would, you pass that over. And what you would end up with is a log message that was supposed to be one line that ends up like two. So that could cause some confusion, right? That might, might be problematic. It's not gonna result you in being hacked. But there's more like denial of service type of thing. So like one thing you could say is, well, just don't use backslash n, like take those out. But there are all sorts of freaky Unicode ways to like restructure similar meanings and stuff. So another one uh, has to do with formatting. So if you're logging in some information uh, and it's just a regular F string, that's probably fine. But if what you're logging into the F string, you can later get evaluated again, passing this like data structure, hmm. asking the logger to fill out the format string, then you can pass interesting stuff. One of the more interesting ones was, uh, you could say percent uh, parenthesis, variable name, close parenthesis, nine, 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 S. And what that'll do is it'll pad the username with a gigabyte of white space and then try to have you write it to the log file. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's bad, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> you could also do things if you knew the data structure that was being passed in to fill out the log string. Had You could sort of try to reach out and get variable names out of it by putting a formatted string in there. And if you marry that with the huge piece of text that'll make the login really slow <laughs> so you could put in like different things and if you see oh this message actually makes the request really slow you could infer that maybe that data is actually in hmm. the variable being passed over so then you could try to get it to write it to a file if you have say file access but not other types of access anyway so there's a bunch of things so basically this the long story short is don't mix like f string formatting along with passing more data to the log file kind of one or the other, because the logger knows how to look for some of these things in when it takes the data and puts it in the format, but it doesn't do that for the original string. So careful about mix and match. Final thing, there's actually, uh, an, it's been included in a pep, and there's a discussion on discuss.python.org. And there's actually a pretty interesting discussion with a bunch of core devs there. So you can see uh, 
that's maybe a better follow up there, but hmm. pretty interesting. Uh, there's no log for pi, but there doesn't mean you can just completely go crazy with unverified user input. You should trust your users, though. I know. <laughs> No. Why not? They're so friendly and considered. yeah. Why not? The real ones are. You know when this <laughs> when this log four J uh, vulnerability came out, and I realized that it wasn't really a big problem in Python. I didn't pay any attention to it, and now I'm I'm actually shocked that it, you could do a denial of service attack using that. Yeah, exactly. It's, I think that's what yeah. it basically becomes. Is there, there's two aspects. One is you can sort of crush the server by having it write so much data. The other that yeah. they pointed out here was if your goal is to try to obscure regular hacking, if you could wreck the log file with so much data that it's really difficult for people to uh, parse the log file, you might be able to hide yourself a little bit better for longer. So anyway, there's some interesting stuff mm -hmm. there. All right, Vusile, over to you. Okay. Yep, thanks. So... If you're building a software as a service platform in Python and Django, there are a few things to think about, you know, like the architecture you're going to use, what type of database you're going to use, uh, whether you use a single database or multiple databases and, and, and all these things. So while I was getting ready for this call, I found this book. It's called Building Multi-Tenant Applications with Django. And it's by an, an author that you've actually covered on the show. Uh, it's a company, I think, called Agile. Um, mm -hmm. this, so this book is free, it's open source, anyone's, anyone's free to read it, uh, download it. And it goes through the different approaches that you'd, you'd have to follow. I mean, the different architecture designs that you can, you should consider when building software as a service or multi-tenant applications. And so one of the things they cover here is, um, where is it? Where is it? Uh, so for instance, it, this all depends on what sort of app you build building so you can have one database with a shared schema where you're using queries to isolate the data right or if you're using a database use um, a database support. something like a postgres schemas can do that and then if you start how you do that in docker so it, it goes through the different ways you can build these multi-tenancy applications. Usili, we lost you for a second there. Let's uh, uh, gotta hold on for a second. Oh no, we lost him for sure. Oh no. Oh no. Bummer. Cool topic too. It is. He'll be back. Hey, Fabio. Out in the audience. Fusili, we lost you for a second there. Are you okay now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm back now. What was what the last All thing right. you heard? <laughs> you were talking about the two different uh, ways in which you could do multi-tenancy. One is like with queries and stuff like that. So maybe just pick it up there and we'll edit it in. No problem. Okay. Can I, can I just share the screen? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Screen. One second. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All yes. right. Take two. All right. So I was saying, <laughs> yeah, I was saying um, this book goes over the different uh, approaches you can you can use to build multi-tenancy apps, right? And then it also covers uh, some third-party packages that you can install that that help uh, do a lot of the boilerplate code for you. Oh, that's really nice because oh, I've considered this. It'd be so great if you're doing some sort of software as a service type thing where you have people log in and you want like that group just to see all their all their data and all their records and stuff. But it's so scary because if you just forget the where clause on just one, on just one, exactly. Exactly. 
they get everybody's data, which is really bad, right? And so this is really cool. Yes. Yeah, yeah. this is so the book covers things like uh, using uh, head HTTP headers or subdomains in the in the request to identify different tenants and uh, how you do that, how you capture that using middleware in Django. That's cool. So some of the middleware is uh, Django multi-tenant, Django tenant schemas, or Django DB multi-tenant. Uh, not a ton of variation yeah. in the naming yeah. there, but it's still pretty cool, right? And some of them use schemas, mm -hmm. and some of them use isolated databases, right? Yeah, yeah. So it will nice. always depend on what your tolerance for cost is and, and, and database uh, management. So if you don't mind having a database for each client, you could do that. And then you'd have to do migrations on each database where, whenever you make updates to the application. Mm. Or if you just want to have a single shared database, you can do that and isolate using schemas. Yeah. I hadn't thought about mm. having to migrate every separate database. But yeah, that's a ton of work. The yeah. deployment all of a sudden looks really <laughs> rough, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, but that's true isolation got, there, right there. Yeah, exactly. There's no way you're going to make a mistake there. D do you guys do anything like this with your healthcare products? Yeah, yeah, we use one of these approaches. I can't tell you which one, but uh, we <laughs> we use uh, we, use, we our software is a software as a what do you call it? Uh, software as a service. We have a mm. number of clients. Uh, they need to have a central login, like the single application that they can all log in and view only their data, and we can't have information from one client leaking over into another. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, really neat. I'm sure that'll be super Very valuable cool. to people indeed. Yeah. Now, Brian, before we move on, how about I tell you about our sponsor? Once yes. again, Microsoft is here. So let's hear from them before we carry on. This episode of Python Bytes is brought to you by Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub. Starting a business is hard. By some estimates, over 90% of startups will go out of business in just their first year. With that in mind, Microsoft for Startups set out to understand what startups need to be successful and to create a digital platform to help them overcome those challenges. Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub was born. Founders Hub provides all founders at any stage with free resources to solve their startup challenges. The platform provides technology benefits, access to expert guidance and skilled resources, mentorship and networking connections, and much more. Unlike others in the industry, Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub doesn't require startups to be investor-backed or third-party validated to participate. Founders Hub is truly open to all. So what do you get if you join them? You speed up your development with free access to GitHub and Microsoft Cloud Computing Resources and the ability to unlock more credits over time. To help your startup innovate, Founders Hub is partnering with innovative companies like OpenAI, a global leader in AI research and development, to provide exclusive benefits and discounts. Through Microsoft for Startups Founders Hub, becoming a founder is no longer about who you know. You'll have access to their mentorship network, giving you a pool of hundreds of mentors across a range of disciplines and areas like idea validation, fundraising, management and coaching, sales and marketing, as well as specific technical stress points. You'll be able to book a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the mentors, many of whom are former founders themselves. Make your idea a reality today with the critical support you'll get from Founders Hub. To join the program, just visit pythonbytes.fm slash founders hub, all one word, the link's in your show notes. Thank you to Microsoft for supporting the show. This episode... Hey, Ryan. Let's hey. <laughs> Did I hit that twice? So... This is a topic that has been very interesting to me, uh, sort of this memory story around Python lists. Yeah. No, um, I'm looking forward to this This one you got to share. Tell so I was, I was interested. This is a, the, we're going to present an article called Preallocated Lists in Python by Redouan Delawar, I think. Um, anyway, the, I've always th I've thought about this before because one of the things that happens with uh, when you allocate a list in Python, if it's empty, it's not really empty. There's some data there already. And one of the first things the article talks about is this data structure that uh, a C struct that Python uses to store basically the info about the list. But it's still space, but it's, you know, it's still, it's empty, supposedly. And then when you, and normally you kind of just append to it. So you, or one way to, to add things to a list is to just append one thing after another. And what Python does it's kind of a neat algorithm. 
is it allocates more than it needs. So if you add, if it, if you, you add like five things or six things or something and there's not enough space, it'll, it'll, I, and I don't remember the real algorithm, but it chunks a, a bigger portion. And then if you run out of space again, you get more space um, added to it. Right. Cause the last thing you want to do is reallocate for one everyone. byte yeah. at a time and copy yeah. the whole list as you're adding a thousand items. That would be super bad. Right. So this, this article talks about three different ways. Like, let's say if you know, you know, you're going to have 10,000 elements in a list. Um, and uh, in this example, it's just counting, you know, uh, zero through, you know, 9,999 um, and filling it into the list. Uh, but, um, but there's, that's, I think that that's irrelevant. It's the same sort of work uh, for each kind of list, but it takes three kinds. Whether, well, the first kind is starting with an empty list and just appending every time. And that seems like it would be slow, but um, it's not actually not that bad. The other two ways are to pre-allocate. And I'm like, how would you pre-allocate? Uh, but uh, his his technique was to um, to take like none and uh, just assign your list none times 10,000. So you got a 10,000 element list of nuns. That's fine. Um, and then as long as uh, none's not a valid value, you're fine. Yeah. Um, and then the, the other, the third way uh, was to take, um, oh, let's see, where is it? Is to, to do a list comprehension and do, um, and just assign your list, the list comprehension um, and then put a for loop uh, for I in range ten thousand in the middle of it. Um, and in in the case in this case, if you if you weren't really just counting to a ten thousand, doing something else, it would be a similar sort of thing. If you'd have a for loop to fill this this in, and I I actually had no guesses as to what would be fastest. So the um, the, the 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 final say when he was doing timing on this was that the append method actually was. Um, was the slowest, but not terrible. Um, it's pretty efficient. And the pre-allocate method, it shaved, so we had uh, 499 microseconds on his machine, um, and then 321 on uh, the pre-allocate. Um, so that's not even half as, I mean, it's not an order of magnitude, but it is faster. And the list comprehension was 225. So that was about half, it was about uh, twice as fast as the append was to use the list comprehension and the list comprehension is actually the most readable of the three, I think. Yeah. So um, it's just sort of a, the, a, I guess it's an interesting article to look at like how to, to discuss like how, how this, uh, this allocating and allocating extra memory happens uh, with a pen. But it also uh, is interesting that the uh, pre-allocate, it seems like that would be the fast, one of the faster ones and it's not. Um, so interesting uh yeah i i wonder if i don't think the list has this i know in other languages it does where you when you create the list empty you can say i would like to initialize you with this capacity yeah right and if it was like a built-in way to say when you allocate your inner c level array pointers make it this big to start with but still sort of fill into it before you start your growing algorithm yeah Maybe that'd be a cool pep for some of the containers if it's not there. But yeah, this I, I think it's natural that the list comprehension is fastest. And also it doesn't, it means you don't end up with a weird programming model where you have a list, its length is one thing, but that's not what you should actually work with. I think that's that's probably not worth it except for extreme cases. A couple of things that I was I found uh, interesting about this that I'd like to pursue a little further is it didn't talk about memory space. So one of the benefits of pre-allocating is you're not allocating more than you need, but I don't know if you're not allocating. I don't know what the, the, the Python algorithm is. Um, but, uh, but the, uh, so I'd, I'd like to see this with space. So how, how much memory is being used by the three methods? The other thing that yeah. would be interesting to see is uh, to throw N NumPy in the mix because I know NumPy has some more efficient. I mean, right. it's, it's a completely with... different beast, but still. If you work with homogeneous data, that's numbers or something or strings. Yeah. Well, yeah. See, what do you think about this? Do you have to worry about these little details? Are you guys under like heavy performance you know, pressure? No, not, not right now, at least. 
um, I've never had to think about like sea level things. And I'm actually taken aback that uh, so much goes into allocating stuff to a list because in Python, you know, allocating stuff to a list is just create the list and put stuff in there, you know. So um, yeah. this is eye opening to me. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's it's not like C where you have to pre allocate it and then fill it out and or something funky mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so Will McCugan is saying I think the list comprehension will pre allocate because the range object has a dunder length hint method that reports its size. And yeah. So I think maybe That's the time fantastic. saving we're get we're getting is that we're not filling it in with uh, nuns to begin with, but actually filling it in with the data we want. Uh, so. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Thank you, Will. I've more than once had a not argument, but a, a disagreement where somebody said, "But you need to show me because," and it's, "Oh, uh, you have a for loop and you just you just append to the list." That's the same as the list comprehension. They're doing the same thing. The outcome, the final result, is the same, but the information that Python has to work with is more, much like writ. Uh, Will was saying here, sorry, Will, is uh, saying here, um, you know, it it can take all the information it has to work with and say, oh, look, it's going to be this long as we loop, and you're going to just add stuff to the list, not use it in other interesting ways. So just go and, and jam on it, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, speaking of working with some data, ah, we're going to get this right. So... <laughs> Let me uh, tell you about this cool project called Mockaroo. You guys familiar with this? No. No. No? So here's the story. Imagine you needed some data, and you want this for testing, or you, this could be testing like unit testing. This could be development. Like one of the big problems with UI apps is having something to display just so that it it fills it out. If I'm going to like fill out a web page and I say, I want to work on the CSS of this, this table or the CSS of this list. If there's nothing in the list, what are you going to do? Right? So you want um, to have some realistic data to work with. So this mockery is this free thing that has all these different types of data that you can work with. So I can come over here and just say, I want some data and I want it in a CSV format or SQL table or Firebase or Excel or XML or, you know, my favorite probably is JSON. And then you can say, all right, well, I'm going to have an ID here. We have like a customer table. So ID, first name, last name. But it has also things like gender. And one of the types you can pick is gender. So it has all these well-known data types so if i go and type in i want a gender not only will it say male female or something it gives you like a list so i can have gender written out as female male or non-binary i could have gender abbreviated as m or f or just binary so you can have like lots of control so if i wanted like you say auto or car what do i got to type out a car you can do like car makes models uh registration numbers all of these things. So you can say this one is a gender abbreviated and like you fill it out. And then you can just say, generate me this data exactly like you want. And then download it in whatever format. Like I said, CSV, SQL, insert statements, JSON, Excel. Isn't that cool? That is pretty cool. So I've used this more than once. Work. I, I can see a use case for this already. It worked. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I kind of liked the first option when you were selecting the gender type, um, having mm -hmm. it be animal names. Um, that'd be fun. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's all <laughs> like there's all these <laughs> there's all these. That's crazy. There's all these different uh, data formats. So you've got um, like cars. Uh, what else we got here? Credit cards, um, GUIDs, ISBN for books, oh. numbers on a normal distribution, passwords. Even MongoDB object IDs. That's cool. Oh, that is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So you have um, mm -hmm. e commerce stuff, money, stock market symbols, um, locations, mm. healthcare. Mm. Let's see how they have about that. Oh, you got yeah, your, yeah. Uh, your drug companies, your NHS numbers, and all those different things. Oh, it's because I'm searching mm -hmm. for car. Like, why is car I keep showing up? <laughs> Animal common names. Yeah. Yes. You could have a wombat or a jungle kangaroo. I mean, these are all sound fun, right? Yeah. So these are all super neat. You can get up to like a thousand rows for free. And then I think you have to pay if you need more than that. 
And then a follow on, I believe this is from the same company, uh, full disclosure, these guys sponsored talk Python, but I wanted to talk about this even before. So, um, they have this thing, the service called tonic that you can then point at your production database and it'll do things like generate me something that looks exactly like production data, but doesn't have any personally identifiable information so that I can give it to the developers to test with real looking data with real variations from our clients, but is sort of safe. Like if they lose their laptop or whatever, or they just leave it open, yeah, it's not going to destroy something. Right. Yeah. That's pretty uh, cool. Yeah. So you basically connect it to uh, your database uh, and then it will go along and uh, sort of create data that looks more like what you actually have instead of just this mockery data. So pretty neat. Anyway, yeah, if you yeah, need to do some testing, you need to generate fake data, not just for like PyTest testing, but also UI development and just something to work with. These are both good options. Very cool. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, Sam out in the audience says, this is fantastic. I agree. And Will says, yeah, super useful. I could see even using this for uh, t testing uh, development of rich and textual out there. So very cool. <laughs> All right, Vusile, off to you. Last one. All right. So this is a fun project that a good friend of mine, Daniele Procida, made. Uh, he's demoed it at a couple of conferences. It's called the Brachio Graph. So the goal for this project is to make a pen plotter powered by Python and make it as cheap as possible using common things you can find in the house. So it's, it's, it's a plotter. It uses a Raspberry Pi, an ice cream stick, and a clothes peg to draw, uh, and a pencil, <laughs> of course. <laughs> right. So it, it's got a Python it. code that turns, that turns an image into, um, I think it's called a raster. It rasterizes an image into uh, right. points, geo, uh, coordinates on a piece of paper. I could and have used the, this yesterday. Oh my gosh, this is great. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if I can play video here, but um, it looks yeah, pretty it. cool when it's, when, it's, when it's actually printing out uh, or plotting out an image. Let me see if I can get it to work here. But yeah, it has a, uh, a motor that that then does everything and it can draw very basic images it's it's a fun project oh, wow. that uh you can work on it uh and it, for, it, it costs i mean the setup for this costs less than 50 us dollars and it's a pretty pretty fun project oh i would have gotten an a in art class if i had this <laughs> <laughs> No, I love it. This is really so neat. People should definitely play the video and watch it because it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the website has oh, like a how-to guides and documentation on how to build this, what what things you need, what uh, sources to the software and everything. And it's also an open source project that anyone can contribute to if you're interested. This nice. is really neat. This is uh, I, one of the things I like about simple things like this is uh, they're great um, projects to, to start kids with because it's mm -hmm. very real and physical. Yeah, I was thinking this would be awesome in a teaching yeah. scenario as well. Yeah. Cool. All right. This is a great one. And I love yeah. it. Very neat to do with Python and stuff. All right. Well, I think that's it for our main items. Brian, do you got anything like to share oh we covered uh last uh i think we covered last week that that the uh python issues were migrating to github and it might be on april fool's day and it was not um so next plan looks like april 8th um uh next one more week if we so keep we'll... talking about it it's never going to happen okay <laughs> Like a watch pot sort of a thing. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm waiting for it to happen. I want it to happen. I know that the uh, transformation will be complete at that point. Right. So next week we won't cover it at all unless it's already happened. But if it's delayed again, we won't cover it again until it actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're not getting roped into this three times. Okay. We yeah. anything else you want to give a shout out to. Yep. Yep. Just one thing is a project that i found recently it's a uh, called thunder client it's it's an alternative video code extension and it's lightweight you download it and install it oh, in, nice. less in a second and you can get started sending, sending requests and it, it has less setup than mm. uh postman and it's right it doesn't need any it's like it's easy to install 
Yeah, so if you were testing APIs, like construct a JSON thing, put this header in, you want to call it? Yeah, Thunder Client for VS Code. Very nice. Yeah. Exactly. Thunder, if you're Thunder. using VS Code. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> nice. you, you, you'd, you'd go, you just switch tabs, you know, instead of switching applications. So that shaves a few <laughs> microseconds off your workflow. Yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> I love it. All right, nice. I've got just uh, one thing I believe today. This is really short. I've spoken about Ingrok at ingrok.com before about how it's really cool for exposing if you're like wanting to expose an API to the outside world that you're developing or you need to debug it. I've used this for like web hooks. So this company, when I, I need to integrate with their web hook. So I need them to call this, but it's not working. So I want like a breakpoint on my machine, but how do they get to my machine? Just run ingrok and it'll tunnel it right through the firewalls using SSH reverse tunnels. That's all good. What I discovered uh, working on yet another integration project was that there's actually this super rich inspector that I think people haven't noticed in there. If you fire up an ingrok thing and then you go to localhost 4040, every request comes through. You can see the, the summary, the, the HTTP headers, the cookies, the response, the status codes, the duration, all that. So if you want to, if you're using ngrok for that sort of use case, uh, be sure to check out this like live web view that lets you dive into. It's almost like the the dev tools, the network tab of the dev tools, but for just people coming in rather than you consuming stuff. So it's pretty cool. That's neat. All right. Are you guys ready for a joke? Yes. Shall we bring it on? Finish it finish out with a joke. So um you may have heard recently that the Microsoft source code for Bing was got by the Lazarus group. And people thought this was some folks in like Brazil or somewhere in South America. It turns out it was a bunch of British teenagers. <laughs> I had like $14 million in Bitcoin and whatever. So they had gotten hold of some of the Windows and um, Bing source code, I believe it was. And there was like, oh my gosh, is this going to reveal a bunch of zero days because people can go through the source code? Well, we don't do that much Windows at least on the server in Python, there's some, but not as much. But we use a lot of Linux, right? And I mean, for all the Talk Python, Python Byte stuff, we've got like a fleet of eight Linux servers. Now, Brian, when I saw this headline, I really began to worry that maybe some vulnerabilities would be discovered or some kind of problem would happen here. So the headline is Linus Torvalds confirms the Lapsus breach after hackers publish the Linux kernel source code to the internet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In a blog post on Tuesday, published hours after the Lapsus posted a torrent file containing partial source code from the Linux kernel, the geek man himself revealed that his branch was cloned by the hacking group, granting attackers unlimited power to <laughs> the article stops there. <laughs> oh, man. How many times do you have to read? <laughs> exactly. I think uh, being open source, it's probably okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. It's public, published the source. They published the source to Linux. What are we going to do? Oh, the, programming. <laughs> <laughs> the programming humor just never stops. I love so, it. Um, so they published the bing source code i think they got some of the bing source code um maybe cortana i can't remember exactly what it was but it was some of these services and i think the windows source code as well i was surprised so i i don't pay too much attention to the blog traffic stuff but i was looking the other day after i'd put up a bunch of uh the transcripts for testing code up uh, i was curious how much we're just getting hit and uh for pythontest.com um i'm getting more traffic from bing than from google is how interesting interesting yeah. all of a sudden mm. bing's pretty awesome isn't it <laughs> or, well it's got nice pictures i'll tell you that it's got nice background pictures it does actually in terms of beauty it's it's really nice and you know i i end up using um duck duck go so mm -hmm. when i'm using duck duck go i know they've got a ton of different sources but one of the sources they use for data i believe is also being and yeah it's it's all right it's all right it's all right <laughs> well, Vasily, it was really great to have you here with us. 
and Definitely. Brian. The pleasure was mine. Yeah, it's great. Great to have a chat with you as always. All right. Bye, everyone. Next week. Bye.